You know, as much as I love working with acrylics in my paintings, because so many of them are literally dozens of layers of pigment, collage, found objects, and thick layers of acrylic medium, it can take weeks to finish a single piece just waiting for the layers to dry. A few years ago, I began looking into encaustic, which offers the ability to create work with a similar aesthetic to my acrylic work in a fraction of the time. In doing the research, I came across the work of Lisa Pressman. Lisa is a fabulous artist from New Jersey who works in both encaustic and oils and has been exhibiting her work for nearly four decades. In addition to making her own work, she inspires others to start their own artistic journeys through her workshops and one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Lisa and I have spoken a few times, and I'm so grateful that we were finally able to hit the record button. Here's my conversation with Lisa Pressman. Please listen carefully. When you go into your studio, are you able to leave all of that behind or does it does it seep into the studio, into the making? Or are you able to sort of just kind of cold turkey cut the, the outside world away just for a little while? It, it comes and goes. Um, I think after, after, after my son passed, I'd go in there and write on all my paintings. Now what? Mm -hmm. I was someone else and now I'm this and now what? Mm -hmm. But at some point it's just like, you just gotta, you just gotta like, I'm going to turn, I'm going to make, I'm going to mix paint and I'm not right. going to think about it or I'm going to turn on my, my paint, the encaustic. And, and so I kind of go in and out, but when, when the actual work starts working, that's, that's the, the, you know, that's the magic place. Yeah. Um, and even if it's for 10 minutes, you know, when you walk away, it, it's, it, it's that quiet space. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, and particularly maybe, you know, right after Sammy died, did you ever sort of lose that identity as an artist and you were a, a parent who had lost a child or did, were you able to still hold on to that? I'm still an artist. I still, I still can make work. That's still something that, that celebrates his life and our lives together in some way. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. that's, that that's kind of my driving identity yeah. through my entire life. And he, you know, he, he was, was extremely talented. You know, I'd got a lot of information from his dad, my husband, Jay, who was a photographer um, and really creative. And, and of course me. Um, so I have not ever really stopped making mm -hmm. maybe, you know what? Maybe after I had the kids, that was really hard. Mm -hmm. That was a hard time. You know, when you have babies around, it's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and I still have to be creative and I still have to have something to say and, and, and. Right. I think, I think I, I kind of gave that up a little bit back then. Mm -hmm. um, although I had a very supportive mother who um, actually helped me, you know, we'd, I'd put the kids in daycare for nine hours a week so that I could paint. Mm. It's pretty special. That was her. Yeah. And were you, I mean, take me back a little further. Were you painting and, and drawing and making as a child or did that come later? I, I can't remember. I, I remember I was in this class in sixth grade. That was for, um, I can't remember what it was called. I, I want to say gifted and talented, but I, I don't think that was it, mm -hmm. but it was reading class. And when it was a, journal writing. And that's when suddenly it was like, oh, there's something more interesting here. Uh, the other thing is I went, my mother took me to Israel um, to visit my sister. And that was a, that was a life changer for me as a 12 year old, because suddenly I realized all the contrasts hmm. in the world, you know, in everything, whether culturally Everything about that trip sort of blew my mind. And then I started taking pottery lessons and that was, um, that was it. I mean, once I started making 
making like that, that was it. In fact, that's what I went to undergraduate school for, was to become a potter. Do you still throw at all? No. And in fact, I studied with, his name was Hui Kukwong, um, pretty well-known ceramicist. And uh, after like a couple weeks in, in class, he said to me, you're not making pots. You need to make sculpture. And he really? turned the pots upside down and said, now go. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Um, and then that turned into um, making sculpture. With I totally was not interested in glazing or firing. So to the point of my senior year, I was using unfired clay and wood. Oh, and wow. Sculptures. Wow. And the, the clay kind of held the wood together. You know, it was 70 something. Those 70s. Right. <laughs> you, you crazy kids in the 70s. Minimal days of not liking that and being influenced by Ava Hess and other women artists. Right. So, so. Did, did you know then that that this would be your life and, and, and that it was, that it was almost predestined from that point? Apparently I, I wrote another class in, in undergraduate. I wrote out, he, um, the class was called Jack Kerouac Ginsburg and something. And the beat generation. Anyway, were you in made, Berkeley doing all of this? Where were you? <laughs> I, was at, I was part of Rutgers at Douglas college. He's a pretty wild guy. But anyway, he had us write a journal out and predict your five year, 10 year, 15, 20. I mean, and I, I found it hmm. and I pretty much so about eight years ago, I pretty much predicted that I would be making art, that I might be teaching, wow. that um, I would have a couple kids, be married to someone who was cre- I mean, I all of those things that have come to pass. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know, you know, the bad shit, but right, right, right. All of that stuff. Um, that's how I saw it. It's interesting because now, if I tried to do that now, it's really hard. Where do I see myself in five? Looking years? out another five or another ten, yeah. Really hard to think about it. When this sort of, I mean, it sounds like it was a, a fairly big epiphany. It wasn't a gradual, like, oh, well, I think I can do this. It sounds like you sort of knew from very early on. Was it? Was that based on love of process or were you making pieces that you were happy with, proud of, et cetera? Or what do you think was the anchor for thinking that this would be the rest of your life? That's a nice question. Um, I think that my identity, I was, I was as a maker, Mm -hmm. number one. And I think that I had an incredible support system for my family. And if they hadn't supported me, um, in, in the ways, particularly my mother, um, it might've been way more difficult. So I think having parents that were supportive, even though my father did take me out to dinner and say, you sure you don't want to be a lawyer or a doctor? (laughs) I'm going, you think I could be a lawyer? Right. I'm really, you know, I'm impressed. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Mine wanted me to be an engineer. I went, huh. Okay. It's like, really? <laughs> it's like saying, Lizzie, you should be a mathematician. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. The other thing, um, did I like my work? I, I got good feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, and I still am proud of the work that I made in undergraduate school uh, that last year because it was, it still feels real to me like what that was, what it looked like. And a lot of those concepts I'm still using in my, in my work now in terms of inside outside and you can, when you, you know, conceal and reveal all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a plan B? Uh, um, Go to school for psychology. Really? Wow. But not really. Mm -hmm. Plan B is what I did for 30 years and that I waited tables for 30 years, right? which surprises people. It's like, uh, yeah. I loved being a waiter. It was, it's a great job. I mean, if you get a good crew and a good, a good restaurant, it, it's, it's the most fun you'll ever have at a job, I think, or it can it be. Taught me how to be a great teacher. Mm-hmm. I really think that's where I got my teaching skills. Hmm. Because you, 
you have to deal with a group, but you have to deal with each table individually. You've got to listen. You've got to hear. They want water. They need, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's the same way with teaching, you know, sort of big picture, but then you've got to be really tuned into where everyone's at. That's waiting. If you're yeah. good waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Where did the transition happen from 3D to 2D? Well, you know, again, it's a material thing. I went to under I went to graduate school at Bard their, their first year at MFA, mm-hmm. and um, one of the, the person I was supposed to study with was um, Jake Grossberg, who was a is a smoking steel, you know, sculptor kind of guy. Um, I, I liked him very much, but he he said to me, "Why are you using clay?" And I didn't have the knowledge at that point to say to him, because this, this, and this. Right. I said, I don't know. So then he had. <laughs> it's what I've used. <laughs> right. And so then he had me dipping in cloth, cheesecloth into plaster. Hmm. And I made these god awful, I thought anyway, um, sculptures. And. And then at the same time, I had met someone who had the studio next to me and she was painting with oil paint and she had some extra stuff on the side, which um, I said, what's that? And she's like, oh, it's a medium. It's wax. You put it in the paint and it makes it really textural. And I'm like, I want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, again, the, the idea of the materiality. Right, right. And so that's when, you know, I think I made a couple of sculptures and then I'm like, I'm going to paint. And I just started painting. And did did the aesthetic or did the process from 3D translate into 2D? Did that help or did you feel like you were starting from scratch again? No, I didn't feel like I was starting from scratch. Um, again, because of the materiality. I hadn't painted in oil before. Mm-hmm. But the materiality of the oil and using the wax. And um, I, I did feel, I, I thought that I didn't know anything about color, which kind of was true because they didn't teach us anything in the seventies about anything. You were just supposed to go in there and work. Right. Um, but the fact is that, and the painter at that point, Alan Cody was a wonderful colorist. Um, so that was my struggle, but I, I, you know, I did, I think that was one of my gifts is the gift of intuitive color. And it's something you've, you've obviously carried through your color work is, is, I think one of the strongest points of, of all of your work, yeah. I mean, you, you see wor- color, you use colors that wouldn't, you wouldn't think of playing well against one another, but they actually do, you know? Yeah. I definitely feel that color is what, you know, I think color changes lives. So, and I, I feel that color is my big strong point. Mm-hmm. Once you started working in color and made the transition to oils, how did your influences change? Who were some of the people that you were uh, looking to for inspiration? Elizabeth Murray. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, uh, and Roth, uh, Ross Bleckner and Susan Rothenberg and it was those those guys. I mean, I always loved Matisse. Always loved Matisse, Bernard, Roulard. My mother would take me to the Met. Mm. And, you know, that was always my favorite place there. But you know, now we're talking in early eighties. It, it definitely was, um, those new image painters, Gregory Arminoff, I don't know, Terry Winters. And were you able to see in that work where you wanted to go as a, as a voice? Did that change your voice or did it, did it just give you sort of permission to pursue your voice or was it something else? Um, I, I I don't I didn't really wasn't thinking voice. Hmm. <laughs> I was just thinking I'm making these paintings and you know they were big moving tense full of tension um yeah they were they had a little bit of an object quality to them I think. Um when I got out of graduate school, you know, then things got then I kind of took a turn around and the work got a little more, you know, like landscape. And, you know, I started playing around with thinness and all this other stuff. But in graduate school, I was pretty, I was just moving ahead in whatever it was. But when, you know, when I do my PowerPoint and I put up an Elizabeth Mary painting and then I put my own paintings up, it's like, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Hmm. That kind of connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
It's funny when you when you find someone that you that you connect with on 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 a very deep level. I mean, there are a couple artists that I Rauschenberg is top of mind. Uh, that f- for me, he's kind of it, you know, in terms of the combines and the collages and, you know, found objects. And, and it took me a long time to really, and I, and I probably still don't understand him completely, but it took me a long time to understand why that work was important and, and what he was trying to do and say, and, and, uh, to, to sort of incorporate some of that, or at least let that inform what I was trying to do. Um, it was more of a struggle than it sounds like it was for you. It sounds like it came very naturally once you, once you sort of opened those floodgates, all bets were off and you, you were just able to make and make and make. Yeah. And, um, the truth is it's on any given day. If you ask me, you know, my influences, in fact, I was just writing them down last night. Um, because when I, again, the PowerPoint business, when I do a PowerPoint, I interweave other artists you know, it, it depends, right? Like there was a Philip Gustin point and then there was, you know, obviously Joan, somebody like Joan Mitchell. I mean, there's so many artists that, um, that there's little bits and pieces, like, I don't know if you know, Jake Berteau, there's this mysterious thing. And and then I was thinking about Kerry James Marshall. Have you ever seen his paintings? Mm -mm. Oh my God. Anyway, you should look them up. There's just so many artists that are, I mean, there's people making great, great stuff to just be inspired by. Right. Not, not to mention being inspired by, for me, taking pictures, um, close up pictures of shadows and patterns. And, and I'm always like close up looking. It's interesting. Some of the work that you've put up, some of the, the, like the 12 by 12s that you've put up, yes. I feel like they are details of a much larger piece. Like we're, we're seeing the focal point of something that exists beyond the borders that you've, that you've shown. Uh, and it's, it's just a really interesting, it's, it's interesting how you're playing with perspective and detail and, and, and really feeling like we're getting kind of a macro look at something else that exists, but that's the entire piece. Yeah. And, and, um, I don't know if you saw this piece that I called a room full of a thousand windows. Yes. It's 60 by 48. Oh, wow. I had no idea it was that big. um, Anyway. Um, it's kind of this idea of, you know, what could a room of a thousand windows be? And in essence, it could be my studio, right? Mm -hmm. Those small 12 by 12s could be the windows in the room. Right. You know, um, and that, you know, a lot of them are, I they have an icon iconic or an image in them. That's kind of mysterious. In fact, I just looked at one the other day that I called shelter two, three months ago, four months ago. And I was like, geez, I called it sheltering or something. Right. Sort of like this prophetic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you know that we don't? Uh, apparently, I do know some things. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, that's so. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because I have that work, and then I have this other whole body of work that I do with, you know, the encaustic. Mm-hmm. Um, Which you've just kind of dipped back into recently. Why the switch? Why why the switch from oils back to encaustic? Was there something that prompted that or was it was it just an evolution what how did you, how did you get back there um it was a couple things i mean i've been teaching a lot and i've been teaching a lot of oil right. and wax painting and so that when i i bring the paintings home i work on them and so um deeply involved i have like 25 of those 12 by 12s and then i wanted to do some bigger oil paintings and then this happened <laughs> Actually, this happened, um, but I think it was really after a couple weeks after the Sam thing. Mm-hmm. Where again, I was like, I don't really know where I'm going, what I'm doing. So, and the weather broke, so it wasn't as cold. So I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to start to paint with encaustic it, because of the the materiality of it, the faster way of building layers, and I love 
the whole scraping and carving down mm-hmm. is um it's that reve- hide and reveal that we talked about earlier yeah and i do that in the oil paintings using the same tools but it's um and it's the color mm-hmm. the, the color of encaustic mixing those colors and using them it, it's pretty much makes me feel good <laughs> well like i told you the other day there's a there's a joy to these recent pieces since you've gone back to encaustic that comes through by your use of color. There, there's a, there's a buoyancy. There's a, there's a fluidity. There's a, there's a, there's something tonally and, and, and sort of existentially different about this work and the way it feels. So I, I woke up in the middle of the night last night and, you know, I had had a conversation with a couple of people in the zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. We're talking about art and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I woke up and I went, holy shit, I just spent, I was in Mexico twice. And I was totally absorbed in the color Hmm. pattern and the weave of that country. Mm -hmm. All my photos are the walls, the, the weavings, the rugs, everything. And if... I mean, that's what's going on in these yeah. paintings. You can absolutely see those those sort of bright, uh, summery, happy colors coming through. Not to say that the other work is, is you know, sort of dark and dingy. It's not. But there definitely is a tonal difference oh, yeah. in how this work feels. And, and I, I think that that's a really, um, I think sense of place is a, something that else that comes through. And a lot of people's work, but in mine for sure, that um, traveling, which is kind of why I like to travel, because it changes your sense of light, mm-hmm. your sensibility, things you see, and how you so you, you synthesize what you see, and then it comes out. Of course, I hadn't really thought about it till last night at two in the morning. Like, oh God, <laughs> here's where this comes from, Miguel. I mean, if I go look at my photos. And, and Oaxaca, that's what I'm going to see. And, right. so, and then I can go back and maybe inform the work with some of the detail that went on in those photographs. But, you know, it always surprises me, even though I know that. Right. It's, it's interesting, though. I mean, I, I've got a friend who he and his wife for six months of the year, they live out of a, a van and they tra- uh, travel around Europe. And he, he's a photographer. And he has said absolutely that the the light is different in different countries. You go to, you know, Lisbon and the light is going to be different than it is in Berlin and the light's going to be different there than it is in Paris. And, and he can, you can, if you look at his work, you can see those subtle changes reflected in the work, the color palettes that are used, how the sunlight uh, hits those colors. And so it's very interesting. I can, I can see it absolutely in your work now that you mention, you know, these trips to Mexico, it makes sense. Well, you know, people think it's trite, you know, oh, the light, you know, when I went to Italy, the same thing. But, you know, I think the best example of sense of, well, there's a bunch of them, but, you know, the the Bay Painters Mm -hmm. or, Mm -hmm. you know, George O'Keefe, not her flower really as much as all the other work, you know, being in Taos and Santa Fe, all of those places change your palette, change your your vision. It's pretty powerful. Has travel affected how much you produce? I mean, are you, are you inspired enough by travel like that, that you would, you, you end up producing more than if you hadn't spent so much time traveling because it just has to sort of get out some way that those reflections, those memories, those experiences. Yeah. I, you know, people think I'm pretty prolific, but the fact is that, I mean, these paintings sit around in the studio for a year or so. Right. And you keep kind of going back and working them. But um, I definitely think that the way that I've been teaching, which is, you know, every month somewhere else, and I I start work, my my work that comes home, they're all demo panels. So they're crammed with, and then you could do this, and then you could do that. (laughs) And And then I bring them home and I'm like, oh, it's pretty close. Right. You know? <laughs> but um, the traveling's been great, except for, you know, it gets a little tiring mm-hmm. for me. It's insp- it inspires me. 
the teaching and the traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And well, and and also the teaching, the traveling. And then every time I go somewhere, you know, I'm in that going to see a museum. Right. Gallery. I mean, going to Chicago is always a fun trip or anywhere. Where was I recently? I was in Berkeley and saw, oh my God, Hans Hoffman retrospective. And it was like, oh, I forgot. (laughs) You know, there's just so many, there's so much amazing art to look at. Do you find that encouraging students to seek out art in person is part of your teaching process? Absolutely. And, and, you know, I can't say it enough. And it's not like, oh, look at this person so you can copy this person. Right. It's like you need to put yourself in a context. You know, it's a way to put yourself in a context. And it's also a way to to learn if you're interested in uh, come up with an idea here. If you're interested in figurative work, you know, but you don't know figurative painters. Mm hmm. You know, it's people get freaked out like, oh, well, then I'll be copying so and so. Like, no, you really won't be because no. I don't think you can do a Giacometti or, a, um, you know, Alice Neal. Well, you've sure. got to see that in your studio. You you give people exactly the same tools that you use, exactly the same colors that you use, exactly the same sort of you give them access to those techniques, but they still aren't going to produce work that looks like you, despite having those so, resources available. <laughs> Once in a blue moon, I go. That's a really nice Lisa Pressman paint. <laughs> what are you going to do? How are you going to make it your own? Right, right. It's using a, an image or so, but it's really true. I mean, everybody's got their own, eventually, sense of self and voice. And so, you know, sometimes I don't know. I have these four paintings that I did that I couldn't help but think that Joan Mitchell was up in the rafters. Hmm. And I was going to paint over them. Because they, of that? Yeah. Hmm. And I didn't. Mm-hmm. I said, it. oh, sorry, am I supposed to do that? You could you could cut that out. Cut what out? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Which, no, I said, um, you know, I'm just going to keep these paintings because, again, they're, they're pretty joyful. And, right. You know, and sometimes the other thing is that someone will say to you, uh, look at this person and or me say to me, you should be looking at this person. I go, Oh my God, I had no idea whose work this was. Hmm. Sisters from other mothers or something. Right. right. You know, so we're, we're all making work, not in a bubble, really. It's a, it's a world in context and uh, it's exciting. Has teaching made you a, better artist? I mean, better is such a weird subjective kind of word, but how, I guess a better, a better question would be how has teaching affected or, or maybe informed your own work? I think that I have, um, I I think that I didn't know that I had a really good eye Mm -hmm. that I could talk and see work until I had to. Um, so I think it's changed my whole um, my whole sense of myself as an artist. Um, How so? It's just given me more confidence. Um, again, you got to remember, I went to school in the seventies where they didn't teach you much. I mean, there was no color theory. There was no. I think there was a foundations drawing, but. There was no two-dimensional design. There, there was nothing. It's, it's just one of those, what that was at that art department. Um, so when I, I actually had an opportunity to teach fundamentals of design, and that, I had to teach it to myself. Hmm. And therefore, and then teach it to the kids, and now use it in my classroom, and it's powerful stuff. It, so it sounds like you you almost had to learn to teach what you didn't get taught. That's you've, right. Yeah. You've come up with a way to sort of build this new curriculum based on sort of filling the gaps in, in your own education, as it were. Yeah. And, I, you know, I did not um, get an MFA to teach. Mm-hmm. That wasn't even on my radar. Um, 
so I was fine waiting tables. And then there was a time in 95 where I'm like, mm, I don't know, maybe I need a fallback. And I went, this is funny. I went and I took all the classwork, coursework to teach high school um, art. And I did it all. And then I had to go student teach. And I said, I don't want to do this. Mm. Um, so I had some of that background. Um, the only the time that I started teaching was when I learned encaustic because I didn't think I could teach painting. Why not? Bed. Because I didn't learn how to paint. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I learned from my friend or I taught myself and I learned some things, but I didn't, I just didn't have the confidence. But in caustic, I could teach because it's kind of like, you know, you do this and then you can do this and then you do that and then you do that. I mean, very, it's pretty uh, technique. More procedural, really. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. You know, there's things you have to do. Um, or you should be doing, let's put it that way. Um, when you, for me, painting with oil, painting the way I paint, it's like, just don't eat the, don't eat the paint and don't create a fire, but <laughs> rule number one and rule number two, yeah, you know, it's way more primordial, right. um, material, the materiality of it. And also the, it's like making some, something from nothing. Right. And, like it's a thing itself. I mean, you could lay down wax, that kind of you know medium and demar resin, and and you could drop something in it, and it changes its nature and becomes something else. Mm -hmm. Painting with oil paints, not so much. You really have to make something from nothing. I don't know that people could fight with me about that one, but that's kind of how I feel about it. So uh, given, given those, those examples, are you, are you happier or more satisfied? Maybe that's even the wrong word. When you produce something with oil that you, that you yourself are happy with versus something with encaustic because it's more sort of finicky. I, I, I think that it, uh, uh be careful what I say. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, that, um, it's all, it's all painting, right. but I think painting with, um, with oil paint is really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and caustic has so much, uh, it's so seductive. Mm -hmm. It can be so luscious. There's a forgiveness to it as well. I think comparatively. You put a brush stroke down and it's gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons I go back and forth because, you know, I don't mind. Sometimes I really like to make paintings that make people feel good. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think encaustic is, is one of those, one of those, it's just one of those materials that I, yeah, I think I do. Like I just finished a big oil painting and it's, it's scary and it's big and I don't know, you know, but I, I feel proud of it. Hmm. I don't know if it's done, but. It's got this weird sensibility about it, light and mysteriousness. But, you know, then again, like in 2016, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Uh, 2016, we all remember that. Um, I made this series. Again, it was one of those times where it was political, but really it was personal. And now I can say it was personal. Where I made these paintings called Stop It. Mm -hmm. Do you remember them? Mm -hmm. With the X's. Yep. And I was encaustic. And I could not get that feel of that in oil. I mean, that was totally the right medium for, for stopping. Mm -hmm. for, right tool for the job. Yeah. And that was really, it was political because of what was going on, but it was personal because of Sam doing his, you know, doing right. his, like, just stop it, Sam. Right. Right. <laughs> just stop it, Trump, please. Stop right. <laughs> so the medium was the message in that instance. Do you, when, when you're working with encaustic, are you, do you find yourself trying to push the materials further to overcome the sort of forgiveness of the material? If that makes sense. Yes. I have moments where I do that. Um, like the X paintings for sure. Um, and then recently I was really pushing the material 
by doing things that I always tell people not to do. Mm. But I did it kind of safely, um, you know, sort of overheating it and getting some different things going on or painting, you know, these new paintings, I paint flat, but then I put them up and then fuse them. So the paint runs down. Mm. I mean, Mm -hmm. gravity of it, right. Of, of the encaustic, when you fuse it, you, you create these things that happen. And that's really about the material. I guess, I mean, it could be for oil paint if you watered it down, but have good ventilation kids. Yeah, that was a, I remember that was the first thing you when I asked you about might have been one of our first exchanges. And I was asking you about encaustic and, and you were very adamant about, yes, this might be interesting, but don't do it without good ventilation, period. Yeah. I mean, safety's Yeah, it's a big one. And you don't think about that, though, with wax. You don't it's not, that wasn't it. It didn't come to mind that that would be an issue. It somehow seemed more, I don't know, uh, non, there's no solvent. Right. Right. The fact is, is that it's like when you light a candle, you can, there, you know, aldehydes are released. You're, you're, as soon as you're dealing with heat, Mm -hmm. you're melting wax. That's, that's where you have to be careful. Right. Right. Um, but that's also where the seduction comes from, isn't it? Partially is, is working with flame and working with fire. There's a, there's a, there's a primalness to the idea of working with encaustic, at least for me, there is. Well, that's why you've got potters, you've got jewelers, um, glass blowing is a whole other crew Mm -hmm. of people who get, um, into encaustic because, and again, I wasn't interested in in firing my clay pieces because that was way too belabored. But I certainly love to see the transformation of the wax when I heat it up. Mm -hmm. That's immediate. You know, I, although, you know, doing raku and stuff, that was always fun, burning burning stuff on top of the pots. Did you ever go the glass route? Did you ever try that? I did. I was at at an old uh, craft school that doesn't exist anymore. And, um, they had glass blowing there and I, I tried it. It's hard. Yeah. It's crazy hard. I yeah. mean, you know, in 20 seconds, that glass is hard as a rock. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. We, we had no, we watched that show blown away, uh, on Netflix. And, and prior to that, I mean, other than seeing like the guy at Disneyland making the little, you know, glass rod figurines, I had no idea that it was such a physical, oh. uh, endeavor. You know, that they're, I mean, they're swinging glass around and you're, and you're, you know, taking these heavy, I mean, it's, it's physical. When you, like, if you go to Penland, I don't know if you know that, but it's like the really famous glass, uh, arts and crafts place. I mean, when those glass blowers, they're the rock stars of the whole place. They Mm. really are. It's like, they're, they're of a certain ilk. You, you, you know, you're not really allowed in that group (laughs) unless you're. (laughs) You got to earn your way into that one your way in that yeah, group yeah yeah which is certainly i get it it's kind of funny how is what's going on right now circa april 2020 do those themes make their way into your work because it sounds like you're kind of going in the opposite direction with the encaustic work and bringing some joy to an otherwise potentially very sort of dark situation well i think i think we me personally um I spent five years grieving. Yeah. Even before. Yeah. You know, um, and, and a lot of that work was dark mm-hmm. and iconic and metaphorical boats and, you know, handbags, <laughs> um, just, you know, those kind of metaphors. And so I'm sort of ahead of the curve. Right. I don't know how to explain it. The only way to, exp- the only, the only people who would understand are people who have been, in deep grief sure. that, that this thing is just like, yep, just add this thing onto the other right. thing. Add it onto the pile. Right. That one onto the pile. Life's been great, you know? Um, and so I, I am going the other way. I need to, mm-hmm. I need to, mm-hmm. uh, for my own sanity. That's not to say though, it, 
things might not change, might change. I mean, I, again, I was stuck in this 12 by 12 and then I really wanted to go bigger, um, in terms of scale. Plus I had had a museum show, um, scheduled for the fall. Mm. Um, and I, I rarely, I have, I don't, I have a really small studio, but so I tried to make big work. Um, I'm is that not, still going to happen at a later date or has it been? I don't know. I yeah. have to get a hold of her. It's been put off twice for my own reasons. Um, and now I, you know, it, it was in the fall. So my guess it's not going to, if it's in 21, I'll be perfectly happy and ready probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other things, I mean, I, I've been playing around with cutting up old paintings and gluing. I hate glue. But anyway, gluing. And, what do you have against glue? Oh, <laughs> what did glue ever do to you? <laughs> oh, your hands get so sticky and then you're walking around going, I can't glue this thing because my hand. Uh. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, mean, I, I don't mind being dirty. I'm a messy painter. But the glue thing, I haven't figured out the glue thing. Uh, so I've been doing some cutouts and trying to get out of the panel or, you know, maybe I'll do some drawings. I, I might do some different things because I don't. I'm not making things for anything right now, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just mm-hmm. going along. Um, I haven't really thought about it. Uh, it's day by day. I am just, um, I haven't spent this time, much time in the studio. I can't remember. Really? I mean, I, I did a one week residency up at Mass Mocha. And that to me was like, I, I got up at six in the morning and, went to the studio was like, wow, I don't think I ever did this even right. in graduate school. I'm not that kind of paint for eight hours a day painter. But do, you, do you paint more in, in waves or in little pockets or how, how is your typical, how does your process kind of unfold? So again, it's, it's depends on the material. Right. Um, if I'm painting with oil paint, I'm walking the dog, I'm walking away. Right. I'm, right. I'm, Oh, and then I'm coming back because it's just wet, wet, wet. Right, right. Um, and caustic, I can find four hours go really quick. So it's, it definitely is a different um, sensibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but again, I think one of the things that I always tell, you know, my students and I remind myself is half the part of them, half of the artwork or making art is making it. And the other half is like, putting it on the wall and looking at it. Right. Waiting yeah. for layers to dry before you can go on to the next thing. Which is why encaustic can be so, uh, another way it becomes very seductive because mm-hmm. you can move quick, but it's also I got a meditative quality to it. Right. That, that I don't think particularly oil painting, well, it could for sure, but I find that encaustic a little more meditative. I really enjoyed the class. Adrian got me a, a one day workshop at one of the art centers here and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to dive into it a little more because I, I I wasn't getting the kind of textures, the sharpness of texture, if that, if I can use that, that I was, or that I do in acrylic. Too Every much. Say again? It's all about the heat. Yeah. So. If you use too much heat, you use you lose the texture. So right, you, it just you, softens everything. And you have to stage fuse. And I mean, we could talk. I, you know, we can talk about what you want to do. Well, I wanted to do the the class with you at R and F, but then then the world decided to go and blow up. <laughs> well, there's that little video. <laughs> it's an hour long. It's pretty good. It's only sixty dollars. Anyway. Wait, um, this is the one that you just put up, yes? Yeah, I've had it for three years, so it sat on my shelf. And l- talk to me about that. Why did it sit for three years? Was it was it not ready to be sold, or were you not ready for it to be sold? So, I don't know. It's just like we did this, and and my husband shot it, and he's you know he's got his he's very uh, well versed in video and photography and this that and the other thing. Um, it, it did. It does not have my particular personality in it. Hmm. Um, but it is a very, I think anyway, I can't stand to watch it, but it is very like specific, you know, even how to hold the razor blade. I mean, it, it definitely gives you a lot of technical information, but I, I'm more apt to 
you know, when I do a live demo and everything goes haywire, I, I kind of enjoy that more. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I don't know. I just wasn't. Does it feel ready. too rigid for you in terms of how you feel that you are in a, in a group situation or in a live situation? Yeah, it was kind of a little rigid. I mean, I, I'm going to do some, we're going to do some more. I'm not going to do, I don't know what I'm going to do. Everyone's like, what do we do now to make money? But um, I, I might do another two, vi a couple of videos like that um, with using oil and uh, the coat, the wax or pigment sticks. And they'll probably be a little less, again, because it's much l less prescription for me. Mm -hmm. You know, in caustic, you really, there are specific things to know that, I, I mean, there certainly are in, in oil painting, but not in my approach. Once you get to a to a certain point with the materials, is there a peak where you can accurately kind of predict what the materials are going to do, and then you can sort of focus on what the piece itself wants to say? Or oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, the and again, teaching has really taught me specific things mm -hmm. that I might have done intuitively, but because I have to break it down, you know, I will know. So like when I talk about actually most of my work, I always describe it as you're building the painting from the bottom up. If you're painting the way I, if you're going to paint, approach it my way, which is, you know, layers. And then, you know, people are like, well, how many layers? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And do you start warm or cool? And right. I know it depends. Right. You know, and they were like, well, are you thinking? And I'm like, well, if I was going to break it down for you, a lot of times I start warm because I'm always looking for the light to emanate from the painting. Mm -hmm. okay? And so if I'm going to scrape back, I want that light, you know, so I can break it down that way. I do have the ability to predict some things. It's just what's the, is there going to be an image? You know, what's the image going to be? Is it, is it? That's always tricky. That's mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. it's just like call and response. One of the best pieces of advice that I have gotten from you so far, and it's something that you you have repeated several times in different videos, and it and it's it's so simple, but in a lot of ways it changed how I approach the work, and that is that you you encourage people not to think about the work as a painting, right. You're not making a painting. You're laying down color. You're laying down form. You're laying down texture. Let the painting emerge. That's right. And that, just that simple sort of yet complex piece of advice, because we all want to think about the end product the first time we put brush to, to substrate. We want to That's think, what is this going to be? What is it going to be? What am I going to do with it? Is it good? All of these things kind of kind of bounce around in our heads, but seeing you teach sort of antithetical Aesthetically to the way that I learned in terms of, of illustration, at least, and letting the painting be what it wants to be and let it have some room to breathe and room to grow and room to evolve. That was a game changer for Aww. me. And I would imagine that, that, that that's met with some resistance on the part of students who are, who are just kind of coming into that new. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, you know, they, there's a couple of sayings that I like to say, which is, and this one I borrow from jake grossberg all the time he'd say lisa you're not making bombs here you know it's not a bomb you can just go in there and make it you're not hurting anyone and right. that is such a great piece of information that he gave to me that i pass on mm -hmm. to my students um and the, the the other thing is like they'll go you're so free and i'm like where else can you do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? This I still struggle with that. I struggle with, with being loose. I struggle with the fear of it not going where I want it to go, despite the fact that, that no painting that I've ever done has gone exactly to plan. Right. I mean, that's, that's part of why we continue to do it, I think. Yeah. Well, right. It's a constant... Uh, well, for me, I don't usually have a plan, but it's a constant exploration. I'm always pushing. Mm -hmm. There are very good painters, excellent painters that paint the same painting for 
50 years or 30 years. Um, but that's not where I'm, that's not where I come from. Mm-hmm. I would be bored, but you know, you, you definitely, um, and then there's the idea of the materials that you don't want to waste them, which I certainly understand. But at some point it's like, you want to do this thing, like just, just freaking do it. Right. Like, You've got to be willing to burn through some, some material. And, and, and then you never know, like, so the other thing that if I can remember how I say it, it's, um, you couldn't get to where you are if you hadn't been where you were. Hmm. <laughs> so if you've had this awful painting and suddenly you paint over it and you've got a fabulous painting, well, it couldn't have been fabulous if it hadn't been awful. Right, 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 right. Um, and that's kind of a hard, that's, that's a hard lesson. Do you, do you, are you able to see that aha moment on students' faces when they do finally get that? Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's a lot of aha moments. And when I see them, I'm like, (laughs) they didn't waste their money. (laughs) My God. (laughs) What a good tip. No, but it really is um, one of those weird, because usually if it's a three or four day workshop, I can predict day one, they'll be excited. Day two. They're going to be frustrated mm-hmm. and read it. And then I get frustrated like, oh, God, I'm such a shitty teacher now. But, you know, that's not true. I, you know, sometimes I think it's true, but it doesn't matter. I get through it. It's just like the painting. Right. Yeah, the shitty painting. It's an evolution as well. Yeah. You, you, you've got to get through the shitty teaching to get to the good stuff. It should be everything. <laughs> and maybe, you know, it's a metaphor for life, right? Oh, God. <laughs> 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 yeah. If you'd like to see some of Lisa's work, visit her website at lisapressman.net. That's L-I-S-A-P-R-E-S-S-M-A-N.net. In addition to her portfolios of work, you'll also find links to her virtual studio visits, gallery listings for purchasing original work, and her nine-part video series for learning and caustic. You can also find her on Instagram at lisapressmanart. Subscribe to Process Driven in your favorite podcast app. Or if you'd like to get every episode of Process Driven along with my other shows in between and iterations all in one feed, subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything. If you're enjoying the show, you can help others find it by leaving a review or a rating wherever you listen or by sharing it on social media. Connect with me on Instagram or Twitter at Jeffrey Sidoris. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S or on my website at jeffreysedoris.com. You can also email me at talkback at jeffreysedoris.com. I'd love to hear from you. As always, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here. And I will talk to you on the next one.